um, approved. There we go. I'm going to move on from there. That's me. Oh gosh, I can't, couldn't miss it. Well, everybody, following that nice interlude into uh, what we're going to do now, and we, now we're going to hear from one of our members of the network, uh, Renska, Renska Ensing. Uh, Renska is a productivity specialist or strategist. She's also a virtual business uh, manager, and she helps her clients who are overwhelmed uh, business owners and solopreneurs and CEOs and creatives streamline their business and sometimes their lives um, in a holistic and intentional approach to taking a uh, holistic and intentional approach to productivity. So she uses strategies and resources and hands-on assistance to get them back into their flow. So without further ado, I will stop sharing here and um, get you out to Renska and let her share her screen. Can oh, I do right. that? Well, I think you're you're not sharing a screen anymore. Oh, so. I'm sharing. Oh, okay. Well, that's okay. <laughs> I, think... I had your lovely picture, but we can do speaker uh, speaker screen so that they see you um, and your I presentation. Will... Okay, I will put my. Thanks, Renska. Technology at its best. <laughs> so hopefully, uh, people can see my screen. Yeah. Um, yes. Which, okay, which is great. Um, I'm happy to see that we uh, have uh, both males and females in the room today um, because uh, we're going to talk about a feminine approach or perspective on productivity. Uh, but before we do that, we have to figure out like what is productivity and what is feminine and what is masculine. So we're going to do a little bit of termino terminology. And um, this might be slightly different presentation that you usually get in a networking um, meeting, but uh, hopefully I'll be able to entertain you with this, uh, with this subject. So um, when we Renske, look at like- May I ask, may I ask something um, before you start? Would you like people to hold their questions to the end? Would that help? I think that's, that's easiest uh, because I think this is a topic that um, is worthy of a discussion. So I'm trying to keep my presentation side on, on the short side. So I'd rather engage in uh, a fun conversation than Wonderful. just keep going on and on and on. So, so if people would um, like to put their questions into the chat room. I'll call on you then as soon as we get to the end. Thanks, Renska. Fantastic. Great. Okay. So um, I'm going to see if my screen moves. Yes, it does. Fabulous. So what is productivity for a productivity? If you Google what is productivity, you get the general description of a, as a ratio between input and output. I think that's a very masculine uh, approach to productivity. And I reframed that to saying true productivity to me is spending the right amount of time on the right things at the right time. So that aligns with the way you want to live your life. And that's what I call intentional productivity. So that's my view on productivity. But what is a feminine approach to productivity? Well, first we have to figure out what is the difference between feminine and female. Feminine is uh, the female principle and female is the biology. So the sex or the gender. And Nowadays, we have a lot of discussions about what is sex and what is gender. So I thought for it to be fully complete, what is the difference between sex and gender? So when we talk about someone's sex, that means referring to the biological aspects of the species that is in front of you. That's not just applicable to humans, that's applicable to uh, all um, mammals and other uh, animals of the world. And gender is a social construct. So when we're talking about a feminine approach, we're talking about a, a construct, a social construct of labels, looking at the masculine and the feminine. And um, so it's not only applicable to females, to the females, the person who has the sex female. So that's why I wanted to differentiate between female and feminine. Um, so why did I come to this uh, subject? Uh, I'm interested in productivity and uh, I thought it was very strange that all productivity books 
or 99.9% .9 of the productivity books and methodologies are written and developed by men. And I wondered why that was. Uh, so I started to do some research. Uh, my research started with just Googling and I couldn't find any conclusive proof. So I thought, okay, I might as well do a bit more actual research. So I looked on PubMed to see if I could find any published um, material on the subject. Well, I couldn't really find things. So I started to look at, okay, what could be a reason uh, that it's the way it is and, and what's the difference actually between male productivity and female productivity? Well, the research I could find is that there is a slight difference in the way that males and females um, process information. And obviously the things that I'm saying are very general and generalization. So obviously there's always the exception, but we're going for general today. Uh, and that means that generally women are uh, left to right thinkers or right to left thinkers and men from to back, back to front. Um, but that didn't really conclude the reason why men might be better or worse at productivity, productivity or vice versa. But what I did realize is that um, if it wasn't in the brain, then what was it? So I had to uh, dig a little deeper. And then I found a study about the difference uh, between male and female hormones. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> okay are we back yet <laughs> oh my god i'm so sorry that was my press, my mouse on the wrong thing sorry go ahead Renske. apologies i'm okay i'm gonna reshare my screen hopefully um there we go are you back with my screen now yes Yes, awesome. yes, 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 yes. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, difference male, female, brain, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, were gonna, uh, I, I was going to look at hormones and I realized that um, I actually had um, a lovely conversation with Lisa in the breakout rooms. We were talking about the fact that um, for generations, it was only men who w went out to work. And um, I think Siobhan, you posted a lovely link to an article about um, President Roosevelt changing the 12 to 14 hour work days to uh, nine to five, and which is fantastic uh, if you're uh, a man. But unfortunately, when we look at what is the actual difference between, oh, now is my, yeah, there you go. Um, if you're a man, that's great. You have a 24 hour hormone cycle. So if you work nine to five, that's fantastic because at nine, you can see your uh, testosterone rising. Then it has a Goldilocks position all throughout the day. And at the end of your working day, it slowly declines and it allows for your rest and relaxation. And again, the, the cycle starts again the next morning. But unfortunately, if you are a biological female, you realize that you do not have that 24 hour cycle, but you have a four week cycle. And we can, the ladies in the room who had or have had uh, an hormone cycle that revolves around those four weeks, we can all attest to that some days out of those four weeks, we aren't on our best. And we aren't in any fit state to <laughs> do anything productive. So if our whole society is focused on that 24 hour cycle, but 50% of our society doesn't fit within that 24 hour cycle, I thought that was really strange. And I was like, okay, that means that if we try to create, um, this is going to be me trying to explain this concept. So if we're trying to build a giraffe, but if we only have rhino parts, you never build a giraffe. So if the male is the giraffe and we are the rhino, 
you're, you're trying to create some sort of weird hybrid creature. So I thought, okay, what can we do to not to solve this problem because it's not solvable in, in, in such, but what if we took a more feminine approach to how we look at productivity? So if we are uh, cyclical beings and we are as humans, um, why not take into account other cycles of our lives? So in order to um, create your perfect and ideal schedule, why not use the rest of the cycles that we have as humans or some of the cycles that we have as humans? And even obviously a male does not have a menstrual cycle, so they might not have to take that into account, but they do have a life cycle and there is a yearly cycle and even a moon and a chrono cycle. So when you look at your life cycle, your needs are completely different when you're a teenager to when you're in your 60s or if you have small children. So taking those cycles of life into account when you create your schedule and when you uh, are looking at the way that you work best, because I think that's what productivity is all about, is figuring out how you can increase or have your best output with the least amount of effort. So making your schedule as smooth as possible. And if we take any or all of these cycles into account, we make our lives much easier. I mean, have you ever seen um, a plant try to grow in winter? Hardly, unless it's a plant that's supposed to grow in winter. So why are we fighting against seasons? Why are we fighting against our circadian rhythms? So if we take our cycles uh, as a roadmap into account, that will make our life our lives uh, a lot easier. Another thing, and that's not a specifically uh, female problem, a lot of uh, males have the same issue, is we're not realistic about our time and especially about how um, we use that time. So if we look at time as buckets, we have 168 hours uh, per week. In the ideal situation, we sleep uh, 56 um, if we sleep eight hours. At, that leaves us with 112 waking hours per week. But if we divide those hours over our, like the bucket system, like I, like I said, we end up with, depending on how you live your life, uh, with X amount of buckets leaving you with X amount of hours to spend. But if you put in um, more time, for instance, if you want to work 40 hours, that leaves you with 24 hours in the other buckets. So if you look at your schedule in this way, so you first figure out where, what cycles do I want to take into account? And then of those uh, cycles, how much time do I actually have left? Because you're, you're going to create a schedule with uh, non-working time because when you are for for example I'm taking myself as an example um, I might not be very good at uh, working at night which leads to me having to do my work in the morning um, but I also want to do I don't know exercise in the morning or whatever so the window of me actually working get smaller and smaller if I need to do other things at the same time. So when, you, when you're trying to create your, um, your ideal schedule, also try to figure out like what buckets do you have in your life? Do you have a family to take care of? Do you have a pet that you need to walk? All those things take time and nobody is 100% uh, productive. Um, so there is a lot of downtime and we are very bad at taking that downtime into consideration so in conclusion what does that mean for productivity instead of planning your appointments and tasks at random be intentional about it and figure out what is my ideal schedule how 
do I work best? When do I work best? Taking those cycles and time buckets into account. And instead of saying yes to all invites, only accept those invites that are within your designated meeting blocks. So basically you wanna create um, good habits by uh, encouraging, encouraging smarter decisions by making them more accessible. So if you have your schedule, your, your time blocks ready, it's much easier to follow your good habits instead of uh, the habits you wanna quit. Um, and last, ad hoc over planned, that means time balance. And that goes back to the buckets. And uh, if you do have to spend time in a meeting outside of your meeting blocks, for instance, take back that time from another meeting block. Because otherwise, if you think about percentages, if you spend uh, more percentage on your meeting time, that time has to come from somewhere. And usually uh, it's, it's taken out of your actual work time or it's taken out of time you spend with your children or any other leisure time that you have. But so take back that time and that allows you to say no more easily because it creates friction and because you wanna uh, say no to that habit. Um, this was a quick um, overview of this. So I'd rather spend my time having a discussion uh, and uh, questions on this. Um, so if you want to know more about me, you can find me obviously here or somewhere else, um, but I prefer questions and uh, discussion on the, on the topic. So I'll stop sharing so I can see everybody again. Thank you, Renska. My God, talk about food for thought. That is filled with information. So hands up, who has the first question for her? I know I could ask her tons and tons. Emily, yes, please. Not, uh, sorry, it's not a question. Uh, it's an endorsement. I met Renske through the networking hub and after a couple of months realized that I needed Renske in my life. And uh, she worked with me on my productivity, which I seem to have lost and time management and everything that she has presented. And me and my business are like a whole new operation off the back of that so she gave a great presentation but she actually puts into action incredible work and i can't endorse her enough that's it oh thank you Amazing. thank you for that emily and um, does anybody have any uh, questions that they'd like to ask following that i have uh, there's somebody else i can hear some um no, I don't know where that's coming from. So whoever is, um, you might put on mute if the, if, yes, Neil, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So I think I might be stepping right into that front to back brain here thing. So I apologize <laughs> in advance, but do you have a way to analyze that your schedule after you've broken everything down into buckets that you think can give you the, I guess, uh, yeah, analyze it to know whether you're hitting your productivity uh, sweet spot there. Well, it's it's hard because we're, um, yes, we can measure, but that means that we have to be very diligent about timekeeping. And usually that's another task and nobody likes to do that. So it is very hard. But um, what I would usually say is, create a schedule that you think is ideal. And we all know that life isn't ideal, but try to figure out what seems ideal and just test it out and keep a log and saying, okay, this, especially um, from an energy management perspective, it, it's, it's really good to say, okay, this task really drains my energy. So I need to move that to the morning. Or if you are a morning person and you get energy from other people, then you might want to do your meetings in the morning. So it's really, um, yeah, a, a, a fine tuning of those things. And it's, it's more um, a gut feeling rather than hard metrics. And I do a quick follow up then. Yes. Uh, so you, you mentioned the energy drains. I know that's a, uh, that's, that's a, a 
exercise I've heard of quite a bit and done myself. Is that how you would suggest getting started on this? Do that energy drain, energy, uh, I don't know what the other side is, energy <laughs> generator yeah. kind of thing? Yeah, for sure, for sure. That's absolutely a great exercise to start with. Um, but it's usually what I usually do with uh, people I work with is I look at what are your priorities, what are your what are your blocks, what is distracting you, then you create your schedule and then you review that schedule. So it's a, it's again a cycle. I'm a cycle person, so that's also a cycle. Um, so uh, figure out what are your non-negotiables. So if you have children, they are non-negotiable. If you have pets they are non-negotiable because you have to actually do something with them obviously your clients hopefully are also non-negotiable and then you have a list you take that list you create that into your actual buckets which become your time blocks and then you start working on it and you realize ah this this isn't it and then you review you tweak and the cycle starts again brilliant Thank you. Megan, do you want to ask? I knew this topic would raise lots of alerts and, and uh, intrigue. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Yvonne. Bon. And uh, Reinska, thanks very much. That was really interesting. Um, really good presentation. And I don't particularly have a question, but I also just want to add to that. I think this resonates so deeply with me because for you, for those of you don't, that know, don't know, I'm a technical and a creative writer. And so I delve into very heavy tech, um, sort of half a day, and I can jump to a technical project. And I am a night owl. And so for me, I'm, I've literally, I don't know if you'd be able to see this, I've color blocked my schedule mm -hmm. because I, I'm inevitably up at night working because it's quieter when I do my tech. And I am surprised when I see the sunrise the next morning. That's the way I, I work my blocks. And my, my, my people that I work with are really in awe of the fact that I actually plan my nap times on my schedule. And they on, I literally have a nap most afternoons because I've been up since three o'clock or two o'clock the morning and I've seen the sunrise. And people ask me how I manage it. I don't seem to feel it that much because I'm supplementing the sleep elsewhere. And it, I just find that for me it works because my, my body adjusts to to the timing pretty well. It's often time is my slump time. And so I go down for a snooze for two or three hours and I need to work back into midnight that evening. And that's the way I carry on. So absolutely spot on there for me, definitely. And I think just to, to add for Neil there, uh, he was asking, go on the fields. I mean, I've, I've redone the schedule probably 20 times in the last year and a half that I've started running this business. And you will immediately feel when something feels off, when it doesn't actually click into your space. I just swivel it around all the time. I change my Calendly link options all the time because if that time's not working for me, I slot it off somewhere else. But the, the certain coded areas that are non-negotiable, like my sleep time, and that's how I'm, I'm creating that space for myself. So definitely resonating there. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks, Megan, for that. Um, Rachel, let's hear from yourself. What, what would you like to ask Renska? Hi, Renska. Thanks a million for that. That was very interesting. It's funny, as you were talking, I was realizing um, uh, one of the points that you mentioned was, you know, you kind of, you take time out and then you, you know, you can take it back. Well, you know, I think it, that is quite a difficult thing. I think, well, for me anyway, I mean, I, I still work as a, a nine to five and I, um, I've been working, you know, like that for years. And I, I try to, I might work late into the, like not as late, I think, as some people, but I could work at eight o'clock or nine o'clock sometimes, but I don't claim that time back. And I think then there's, there's not a balance. Mm -mm. And so, and I try and schedule, I have like monthly plans and weekly plans and all that, but sure, they don't always go, you know, but I appreciate what you did. Like it's, it's kind of given me food for thought moving forward to be a little bit more productive um so thank you for that oh you're welcome and it's it's not just about having uh like a plan in the sense that you plan out your task it's more like when do you uh work best on mm. like 
high energy tasks and when are you more on the low energy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. taking, taking time back from your uh, uh from the time that you work on at night uh, during the day is works for not for everybody but for a lot of people um it does because then you can go to the grocery store during the day or you're much more flexible mm, definitely thank you thank you Keely, would you like to um, ask your question? Yeah, thanks, Renska. I really enjoyed that. I um, I really struggle with productivity and should uh, definitely do something about it because I have had clinical burnout twice in my life. Um, and so I know that I need to do something, but I really struggle with the mum guilt between you know time with my children and time with work. But something that I hadn't thought of was seasons. And I'm wondering whether you think there is a lot of value in seasons, because I know myself from October till February, I have no motivation to do anything. <laughs> it gets dark, it gets dreary, it makes me miserable. Do you think there is a, is a is value in almost packing your work into those spring and summer months where you know you're more productive, so you can almost hibernate more yeah. in autumn and winter? Yes, 100% yes. It depends on the person, of course, but, um, and, and if you are sensitive, some people have uh, like seasonal, uh, seasonal sadness, so to speak. Um, so for sure, and especially uh, people uh, who have children who have, for instance, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 weeks in the summer who are off. So um, yeah, absolutely worth looking at uh, seasons following the seasons in whatever way works for you um, and there is a there is a reason why um, winter is a reflective period and um, if you mimic nature then you can never go wrong so I would definitely keep that in mind thank you fabulous thanks a million okay last question before we break out into the next rooms um Claudia where are you here my yeah. internet sucks <laughs> my internet sucks, so it may fall. Renske, thank you. No. For reminding us about the cycles. You're back. Can you hear me now? Yeah, my internet sucks. Thank you for reminding us about the cycles. Because, you know, the hormonal cycle, but I hadn't thought about the seasonal or the, the other cycle. So thank you for that. And interesting that you mentioned clients should be non-negotiable. I think we need to be alert and educate our clients not to be time suckers and not to do scope creep because those are tremendous uh, dangers to our productivity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, what, God, Renska, amazing, amazing uh, presentation. I'm going to stop our recording now. Um,